morning and welcome to lab this week. We are covering the male and female reproductive systems this week. Next week, we'll do um, embryology and then we'll have a review for the lab practical and the lab practical will be due the week of the 28th. I'm going to give you the whole week. To, so actually, you got lots of time. You won't want to wait that long. So well, no, I'll give you to the 30th. I'll give you to the April 30th to get the lab practical done. Um, and because um, that's just pushing them too far because you need to be thinking about the final exam. So um, anyway, that's that, so that's what we're doing today. Oh, also, I ran into Logan yesterday and promised him that we would take time after this class to go over ABGs. So we'll do lots of problems together, do them on the whiteboard and um, to, till we get to the point where um, Logan knows what he's doing and everybody else. So I'm sure Logan's not in the, is not the only one in that boat. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and share our screen. So you need your purple packet on reproductive system and um, let's go from there. So if we look at this picture right here, this is a cross section through a testis or a testicle, and you are looking at something called a seminiferous tubule. So let me draw, I like to draw with this thingy. Okay, so let's do, let's do that color. And all right, so this structure right here is called a seminiferous tubule. And in the seminiferous tubule, you will find these, the cells that are all right here on the edge are known as spermatogonia, but that's not on your list. But these are the cells that are going to give rise to the gametes. But I do want you to know gametes. So I'm gonna write that down on another spot because you can't see on this very well. So a gamete is a sex cell. And the spermatogonia are the cells um, that actually came from the yolk sac. We'll learn about that next week. And, um, and came into the tissue that became the testes. And that's the only tissue in your body that becomes, uh, or that goes through meiosis. Um, meiosis is the process whereby uh, haploid sex cells are produced. So we're, we're gonna define all of those terms here in just a little bit. Um, so these cells will divide uh, will replicate their DNA once, but divide twice so that you have a cell with only 23 chromosomes in it instead of the typical 46 that we see in all the other somatic cells. These are germline cells, so they're the ones that are inherited. Um, as they go through their mitosis, which will, or their meiosis, sorry, which we'll learn about when we get into male reproductive system, they, they end up as spermatids, so out in here are where the spermatids are, primary spermatids. That's not the word. Primary and secondary? Oh, early and late, that's the word. So that's the early spermatids are here. And then the late spermatids are these guys right here. So you can see there's just a, con a continuous process of spermatogenesis happening within this seminiferous tubule. And so by the time you're a late spermatid, you go through spermiogenesis and then here's your little head and your tail and so these are all the little tails of all the sperm and they're still not mature they're going to go down through the seminiferous tubule and we'll learn about where they go today and um eventually they'll be ejaculated eventually they'll be mature and eventually they'll be ejaculated and hopefully start their journey on the creation of another organism um one other thing we want to take a look at here in between. So this is a seminiferous tubule here and a seminiferous tubule here. You get the picture. Then we have some tissue in between the seminiferous tubules. These are known as interstitial cells. And these are the, um, the endocrine tissue of the testicle that um, produces testosterone. So in the interstitial cells, they will produce testosterone. I just really like that picture a lot. All right, so we're going to go on and we're going to take a look at the scrotum, but I don't want that view. This is the view that I want. Okay, so um, here is the scrotum 
And it, of course, is this um, sac outside of the man's body, outside the pelvic cavity, where the testes are housed. So the testes actually form up here in the pelvic cavity, but about seven months, they're going to descend down this direction through this inguinal ring right here. That, well, this inguinal ring right here. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, where they will be housed in the, um, in the scrotum uh, because spermatogenesis has to occur at 94 degrees and 98.6 is too warm for spermatogenesis. Um, if you have what's known as, oh, I can't type on this one. And eh, we'll do that in the, another thing. If you have... Um, something known as crypt orchid orchidism. I'll type that out in, in just a little bit. Um, uh, the testes fail to descend. And if we can, if we can detect that early on, um, after a male baby is born, then we can bring those testes down and make sure that, <clears throat> that uh, they don't become infertile because uh, if those testes remain up in there, up in the pelvic cavity, then they won't be able to reproduce. My grandma used to have poodles when she was alive and, and her very last poodle that she had, um, he had cryptorchidism and his testes didn't descend. And so she got him for a really good deal because he, even though he was a purebred, um, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't um, stud worthy, I guess. I don't know what the Breedable. word is, but, huh? Breedable. He what? Yeah, he wasn't breedable and stud worthy. I like that term. Um, so yeah, so she he was. She didn't have to. She didn't have to neuter him. <laughs> I just came that way. Okay. Um, so anyway, there's just some background there on the scrotum. All right. So the scrotum is actually going to be analogous to the labia majora in the female. Um, when we get into embryology, we'll see how we all start with the basic floor plan and then we make modifications to that floor plan based on what our gender is. So here you can see, so if you think of the labia majora, the two folds on the outside of the perineum in a female, um, uh, those are going to come together. And when those two folds come together, then they create this middle septum right here. Okay. So each testis is housed within its own sac, its own side, like the lungs, you know, and um, so you, you don't have to worry about, you know, if something happened on one side, then you've still got a testis on the other side that can, can handle the jobs. All right, so that's the middle septum, dartos muscle um, and cremaster muscle. So uh, by being out in the scrotum, um, the temperature is going to vary um, more than if you were within the pelvic cavity. Because you know in your pelvic cavity, you're, unless you have a fever, your temperature is going to be you know, 37 degrees Celsius. And, and uh, so we need a means by which we can position the testes uh, either closer to the body when it's colder or farther away from the body when it's warmer. And so these two muscles then are going to regulate the position of the testes relative to the body. So the first one, the dartos muscle has to do with the position of the scrotum. So here is dartos muscle right here. So this gray right there. You know what? Let me clear all of this and then start all over again. Okay, so dartos muscle. So, oops. All right, so here was that middle scrotum. I mean, middle septum. Okay, here is dartos muscle right there. And so what that will do is it contracts, is elevate the scrotum and bring it up, up closer to the body. So when it's cold, then the dartos muscle will contract. Now, the dartos muscle is smooth muscle. And that's very important. Now, I don't know why it's that important, but it's smooth muscle, okay? So it's, it's involuntary. The other muscle is the cremaster muscle, and that's all of this musculature right here. Where's cremaster? There it is. Okay, so that's cremaster, and that's gonna be within the spermatic cord. 
So in this cord that includes the testes as well will be this muscle, premaster muscle. And that one, interestingly enough, is skeletal muscle. Okay, so, so what does that imply? That maybe we have voluntary, we, I don't, um, that males have voluntary control over the position of the testes within the scrotum. I'm not gonna ask anybody if that's true or not, so there it is, but um, it's skeletal muscle in the cremaster. And how we came to find that out, oh my gosh, it's been forever ago, I had a student say, Miss G, is it true? that samurai warriors have control over their their scrotums and and being able to pull them up and so that they are less at risk in battle <laughs> all i told me i don't even know i didn't even know that um but i don't know i doubt i think that's just a legend but possibly i don't know all right so um so anyway, there you go. Cream masters in the spermatic cord and that skeletal muscle. Dartos muscle is in the wall of the scrotum and that smooth muscle. All right, so let's look at the testes now. Let's go back. No, 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 we need to go forward. All right, so here is a bunch of pictures of the testes, but I want this one, so I'm gonna make it big. All right, okay, so the testes then are the gonads. Oh, you know what? Let's go ahead and do our definitions right now. Okay, so, oops, I want um, text. Okay, so here are some terms I wanna make sure that we have also in our vocabulary. So first of all, we need gonad. Okay, so a gonad is um, gamete producing structure, often glandular as well. I don't know why, but often, just put glandular as well. Can you guys see that when I type, or do, do I have to click out the text box and then it shows up? You can see it as you're typing. Okay, perfect. All right, so what's gamete? That is a, oops, I didn't put some, I need to add. Uh, a gamete is a sex cell, is a haploid. cell. Um, and then we want to put what the two gametes, because I forgot to put the gonads in, so I'll put those in just a minute. Um, so sperm are male, too many colons, and then um, ova, oh yeah, oops, oval, <laughs> ova are female gametes. Okay, over here, then we want to put testes on the male gametes, and then ovaries are the female gametes. Nope, gonads. Okay, um, haploid means one copy of each unique chromosome. So our haploid number in humans is 23. Um, let's see. What else did I want to say? Something else. Mm, I don't know. We'll leave that for now. We'll come back to that. Um, Can you go back to that real quick? No. That good? you want to also do the definition of a fail to descend testy? What is that called? If I, what? Say that again. The, the crimp. Oh, crypt orchidism. Yep. Failure to descend. Yes. Okay, um, so if you want the definition for cryptorchidism, I love this. That means hidden fertility. 
because orchid means fertility. And so your testes are where your fertility comes from. So the orchid flower, I don't know how it became like the symbol of fertility or whatever, I don't know. But yeah, that's where orchid is testes and means fertility, so. Anyway, so it was funny, one year after um, I had finished this, you know, because it's at the end of the semester, and then right at the end of the semester, two of my students brought me an orchid. <laughs> Although that was really sweet of them, so. And then I killed it, because <laughs> I guess I'm not very fertile. All right, okay, so let's look at the testes. In the testes, the only thing that I need you to know, I should tell you, I should put reedy testes on and efferent ductual and tunica albuginea, and, but I'm not. So the only term that I need you to know are the seminiferous tubules. And yes, seminiferous tubules, very important. They are all of these yellow thingies. So each one of these, and then a section of seminiferous tubules. So like this part right here, that's a lobule. Um, is just one unit of a seminiferous tubule. So in this picture, you can see we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight seminiferous tubules here. Okay, so that is where uh, meiosis occurs. So spermatogenesis, meiosis, all of that will happen within the seminiferous tubules. All right, now um, the seminiferous tubules are going to pass, or the sperm, sorry, let's go on a pathway in the sperm. So they're going to go through the seminiferous tubules into this little network called the reedy testes where we're going to hang out and finish going through maturation and then we're going to go to the efferent ductuals and then we're going to go into this structure right here um so if we this always may, looks like a grub to me you know some beetle larva right there okay but that whole thing so it would be this whole area right here is called the epididymis so this is kind of like a little cap on top of the um, on top of the testis, and it's going to eventually turn into the ductus deferens. Okay, so all of that. We also have sperm maturation going on in the epididymis, and then this is where they'll sit and wait until it's time for them to be ejaculated. Now, if it's not their turn, so let's say that you did not have an ejaculation today, then the sperm that were ready to go then are going to be absorbed back into your body. So you always have a fresh supply every day. Um, we don't have them just, and it takes about 30-something days, I guess, for, for a sperm to mature. Um, so, you know, you always got, so day 30, this one's ready, and then tomorrow a new batch will be ready, and tomorrow a new batch will be ready, and so on. And um, So, yeah, if you don't ejaculate them, then they, they get, uh, it's probably apoptosis, I don't know. But anyway, they disappear. So so you don't store them up until you explode or something like that. So, um, so they just go away. Um, okay, so that's the epididymis, and then we go into the ductus deferens. Um, you may have heard it as a called a vas deferens before, and so when we make a little incision right here to to cause permanent birth control in a male, um, that's a, called a vasectomy. Um, and the reason why we really call it a ductus deferens, and I put vas in parentheses, you know, just for familiarity, remember, you know, some of the people have heard that term before. Um, it's not a vessel, it's a duct. And so that's why we changed the name, I guess. But anyway, so the, so the ductus def, or the, yeah, the ductus deferens is going to be, begin down here, and then it's going to travel up, and then we'll travel up the spermatic cord, and and we'll follow its pathway as it gets back into the man's body, because this is how the sperm, once they're made in the um, in the testes, are going to make it up so they can be ejaculated out through the penis. Um, uh, okay, I was going to tell you about the vasectomy. So here's how a, a vasectomy works. Now, um, there I have friends who have vasectomy babies. So what the heck is a vasectomy baby? Well, it's a baby born to a couple after the man had a vasectomy. Because you have to wait at least a good six months to make sure after the vasectomy to make sure that it took. Now, the way they used to do it, it would just cut here in the back of the scrotum and then just pull out the ductus deferens on either side and then just cauterize it and put them back in and away you go. However, 
Um, the urge to reproduce is very powerful and the two ends will grow back together if not done properly. And so that's what happens is that those sperm could still leak through and make it on to be ejaculated and then impregnate um, the mother and then you get a vasectomy baby. Um, but so here's what they do now to prevent that from happening. So I had a student several years ago who um, his wife was pregnant during this time and she was super high risk pregnancy. Um, they were in the doctor all the time. They were really worried about blood clots coming from the placenta because she had some issues with their first baby. And so when she got pregnant again, um, they were very, very concerned about her. And, and uh, so um, after she had her baby and they went back for, you know, postnatal visit or something like that. And the doctor said to, to my student said, um, you got to go get yourself fixed or you're, if your wife gets pregnant again, you'll be raising those children on your own because she will die. And, um, so he's like, okay. So he went and got a vasectomy. And so he came back and it was in the summertime. I just happened to be in my office and he and he pops in, and he goes, Mrs. G, I gotta tell you all about my vasectomy. And I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. And he goes, no, really. And so he, you know, his doctor was telling him, yeah, they the ends do seek each other out. So here's what we do. So they they cut it, they cauterize it, they fold over the ends, they suture the ends, and then they put them back in so that they can make sure that that super powerful drive to reproduce does not allow any more babies to get made. So I love that story about a vasectomy. All right, um, so let's go back to this picture here on the, not that one, okay, on the inguinal canal. So here is the inguinal ligament, this white right here on either side, and essentially that's what's gonna keep your insides in. Um, but there are a few things that need to pass through that inguinal ligament. Obviously we need over here, we need to um, have the external iliac artery and vein and the um, femoral nerve to go through the inguinal ligament so that it can go down into the leg. And then we also have the gonadal artery and vein and this nerve right here. And the ductus deferens also have to pass down through the inguinal canal to get down into the testes. So, or the inguinal ligament. So there's gonna be an opening right here so that they can go down through there. So that, that inguinal canal is, is bigger in males because you gotta let some testes through than just for the gonadal artery and vein and nerve to go through to, well, they don't have to go out of the body at all. What am I thinking? To stay inside here. So girls, we don't have this. And so boys, this is when you get inguinal hernias why you're more susceptible to it than females, obviously, because you have this opening. And so you can put strain on that and, and weaken that. And then if your intestines get down in there, then you've got that inguinal hernia and that's nah, not good. So that's why boys get hernias more often, inguinal hernias more than females do. Okay, so the spermatic cord then is this cord right here. So let's underline everything that we find in the spermatic cord. Okay, so here's our spermatic cord. What will be in there? Ductus deferens. Where's my ductus deferens? Right there. Okay, testicular artery. Um, and then we'll just do the, the pempiniform venous plexus is just the, the veins okay, going back. So just no veins. Okay, so artery, vein, and ductus deferens, and autonomic nerve fibers. Okay. Um, are going to all, oh, and the cream master muscle, where is that? Okay, so those are all of the things that are going to be within the spermatic cord. All right, um, okay, any questions up to this point? Because we've been outside of the body, or outside of the cavity, I guess, the pelvic cavity. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the pelvic cavity. So we're gonna take these little sperm, and we're gonna go up through the inguinal ring, and then we're gonna go into the pelvic cavity. Um, nope, not there. I'm gonna go back to this picture. This one. Okay, so this is where I wanna be now because we're gonna go into the ejaculatory duct. But um, 
let's follow the Dectus deferens. So here it is. Here's where it would be going through. Nope, up here. Here's where it's going to go through um, next to the pubic bone through the inguinal ligament. So it's still outside. Now we're going to go up over the top of the urinary bladder behind the ureters. Sorry, I'm eating some parsley. And then we're going to come around, boom, to there. Sorry, I couldn't get the shell off. All right. So we're going to come to ejaculatory duct in just a second. So what I want to look at next is the seminal vesicle or the seminal gland. So that's this thing right here. And that's going to make semen. So semen is the fluid stuff that's inside of the ejaculate. Okay, so this is a fluid that's produced so that the sperm have something to swim in. So now we need a place for um, the sperm as they're entering into the man's body and the semen to mix. So that's this tube right here called the ejaculatory duct. So this is where the sperm meet the semen so that they can get mixed together. And that ejaculatory duct runs through this gland right here called the prostate gland. Now also within the running through the prostate gland is what we call the prostatic urethra. So this is gonna be carrying urine from the urinary bladder eventually out of the man's body. And the ejaculatory, ejaculatory duct is going to hook in to the prostatic urethra right there. Um, the prostate is also going to produce some secretions that it's going to add here into the prostatic urethra to enhance the nature of the, of the semen to give the sperm more of what they need. Okay, so that's ejaculatory duct, seminal vesicle, prostate gland. Now, bubble urethral gland. And I don't know why there's a hyphen in there. There doesn't need to be one. But over here, have this little gland that's going to start at the head of the penis right here, the bulb of the penis right here. So um, as you're uh, aware, as you're familiar with the fact that urine is acidic. So here in the urethra, in all these parts of the urethra, um, there's going to be acidic urine in here. Well, if you're ejaculating sperm right here, that acidic environment is going to kill some of your sperm. So you can't have that happen. You can't sacrifice. I mean, sure, you're going to secrete 400. You're, oh, you're going to ejaculate. I don't know that secrete's the right word, but you are going to ejaculate about 400 million sperm at a time. And you would think, oh, that's a huge number of sperm. I can, I can sacrifice a few sperm. Nope, you can't. So we don't want to damage any of those sperm before they have an opportunity to get into the super harsh environment of the female. Because it's just like storming the beaches at Normandy during World War II. And you don't want your little guys in your boat that are coming to the beach. You don't want anything to happen to them because that's your force. Okay, so you got to protect those guys. So how are we going to protect them? Well, we're going to neutralize this environment first. So ahead of the ejaculate, the bubble or urethral gland will secrete a pre-ejaculate that will come in here and neutralize this just ahead of the ejaculate. So some of, besides erection as part of the male sexual response, you need to secrete that pre-ejaculate material. And then once that's secreted, then oftentimes the ejaculate will follow that. Maybe, maybe not, but at least it'll come sometime after that. And so, so the function of the bubble urethral gland then is to secrete an alkaline secretion so that it'll neutralize the acidic environment of the, of the urethra. Um, the only part, we have a prostatic membranous and spongy urethra as it's going through different portions. The only one that I need you to know is spongy urethra. So this is the one that's actually in the penis. And we call it spongy because it's in this corpus spongiosum erectile tissue right there. Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so spongy urethra. All right, so any questions on those? 
Okay. All right. So going into the penis then. So the penis is part of the urogenital system. Sometimes we can put urinary and, and, and reproductive systems together. They have a common origin and, um, and the penis is going to be part of the urinary system to deliver urine and it's also going to be part of the, of the reproductive system to deliver sperm into the woman's body. So um, there that. But anyway, down here at the bottom, we have this enlarged area of the penis called the glands or the glands penis right there. And so it's this area here made of corpus spongiosum, um, erectile tissue, and lots of nerve endings for stimulation of the um, parasympathetic nervous system, obviously, because it's um, feed or breed now. So now we're in the breed part of feed and breed. And um, so this is super sensitive out here. Now, to protect this area, you have um, some skin that comes down, oops, comes down right here, comes down over the top of the glands called the prepus or the foreskin. And this is what gets um, circumcised. Um, there's no real need to circumcise because obviously you're born with it. So why would you be born with something that you need to turn around and, and cut off? So historically, where, where did circumcision come from? Well, it's a, it's a tradition, it's a ritual in the Jewish religion to indicate which, who was a Jew, who was a, one of the children of Israel. So the whole Abrahamic covenant that you were circumcised to indicate that you were um, a Jew and not a Gentile because the Gentiles didn't circumcise. And then I don't know how in the Western world, I guess just as the diaspora happened and Jews went throughout the rest of the world, then it became a tradition. Um, but it doesn't have to happen. Although but at one point they, there was a theory that it basically was cleaner to not have it. And that's why they pushed it so hard. Probably. Mm -hmm. And then that was like, everybody got circumcised. Um, so let me just give you some, some things to think about if, when you have a, a son. Um, I had my son circumcised just, you know, basically so you look like everybody else. And so you don't have to worry about retracting it to clean it because you do. You have to pull back the skin and get back up in there or stuff can, stuff can collect in there. I do have an article that I usually read. I don't know where it is right now. Um, that says the micro environment of the um of the penis of the if the, if you're not circumcised if you're uncircumcised male um can promote the transmission of heterosexual aids um and so they found that that circumcised males um had less of a heterosexual aids transmission risk to their partners to their female partners um so there's that um also could contribute because i heard um lessen the risk of cervical cancer in females obviously not males um because cervical cancer is caused by the hpv human papillomavirus and so there might be less opportunity to to transmit that from from male to female um so those are some things to consider but like I said, you're born with it, so why cut it off? But um, one other thing I'll just tell you right now, um, bless my poor dad's heart. So my dad wasn't circumcised. And um, when he became really ill and um, with Parkinson's and, and he couldn't give a um, urine sample, uh, he had a urinary tract infection and that we wanted to treat. And, um, he couldn't voluntarily control um, his sphincters anymore. So we couldn't, you know, just donate a urine sample. So we had to catheterize him to get the sample out. And um, 
the the nurses at the hospital um, just could not catheterize him. It, the foreskin had become so so um, tight around there that they they were just having a really hard time getting the catheter in. And then we had this this um, LPN lady that was working at the hospital that had just been doing this for working as LPN forever, and she knew how to catheterize and. She's all, let me do it. And she just poof, and that was it. But, you know, bless people that have been doing stuff for a long time. We figure out how to get stuff done. And she was awesome. It didn't cause her a problem. But the newer um, nurses that were working there, they were having a dickens of a time trying to get him catheterized and get a sample. So anyway, there you go. There's some stuff to think about with, uh, with um, what is that called? Circumcision. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of the erectile tissue in the male. So the first one we're going to do actually is cor corpus spongiosum. So that is what goes around the, the urethra. So this, and it goes down into the glands. So all of this is corpus spongiosum and this come up on the other side. Now notice that it says corpus spongiosum. That means there is one body. This is singular and, well, corpora. Dang, they messed up. You have two corpora cavernosa erectile tissues, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So here's the corpus cavernosa on one side, and then you have a corpus cavernosum on the other side. So we'll go to a different picture, and I'll show you those. All right. Okay. So we'll look at this one first. So here's a, a coronal section of the penis. And um, so here is, and so here you see corpora cavernosa, also another Harry Potter spell, because um, there's one, and then here's the other one. And then if we look at um, the spongiosum here, is the whole spongiosum and it's just one it's just split by the urethra okay so one corpus spongiosum erectile body two okay two corpora cavernosa erectile bodies then if we look at one more picture then we can see it really well so here i have a cross section through the penis which is the last thing because then we can also see the dorsal vessels and nerves that we have on the penis. So here is, ooh. okay, so here is one corpora cavernosa. There is the other of the corpora cavernosa. And then here is the one spongiosum. And whenever I look at this picture, it always reminds me of South Park. So I don't know if that does it for you guys too, but it makes me <laughs> think of some of the characters in South Park. Okay, so any questions on the male reproductive system? Why, um, or I guess more of a question, that people had said um, people with diabetes can lose the ability basically to procreate due to their diabetes, what gets damaged in the process in order to do that? The blood vessels. It's always blood vessels. Maybe With some diabetes. neuropathy. There might be some neuropathy in there as well because mm -hmm. we know capillaries become very fragile in diabetes and then we also have um, the neuropathy. Probably, I'm not sure how the diabetes causes the neuropathy, um, but you know you've got... Um, um, in your feet. My dad, mm -hmm. diabetes, his neuropathy was really bad. And then if we think about in your eye, diabetic retinopathy, that's where the capillaries in the retina all get very fragile and break and cause blindness. My grandmother, my dad's mom, um, got diabetic retinopathy and she went blind. And um, so I think it's just, just that hypertonicity of the blood really affects both the the capillaries and the nerves. And so it would do the same thing in any tissue where you add capillary beds and, and you got lots of capillary beds, lots of blood. So basically you wouldn't be able to ejaculate. You wouldn't be able to get erect. You wouldn't be able to do any of those things due to the 
damage that's been yeah done. if if the neuropathy depending on because you have to have both parasympathetic and sympathetic responses so erection is parasympathetic and ejaculation is sympathetic so i uh, you know maybe there's some neuropathy in both of those systems so that you can't ejaculate um but definitely i would think with the blood flow and the whole um erection that the rectal tissue would be affected by that hypertonicity of the blood interesting okay thanks okay all right and then the dorsal vessels of the penis are just these vessels that are here on the back okay so there's there's that now we'll go on to the female reproductive system i think i've got less stories in the female i don't know maybe i don't who knows <laughs> all right so we're not going to worry about all of that or that we'll talk about that all in lecture um and okay female all right so let's um take a look at an ovary i don't like i wish i had more of a drawing of an ovary they don't they used to have this in with the set of pictures but they don't anymore um i don't think so we'll take a look at it again in a drawing but we'll look at first this micrograph of the of the um ovary so we got two parts again to the ovary we have the outside part which is the cortex let me draw oh let's see it's gonna be around here okay oh this is really hard um because i cut follicles everywhere uh, we'll kind of just do it like that because i got to avoid any follicles i trapped a fo follicle by accident in where i outlined um so why why was it hard for me to draw the medulla because there are so many follicles in this picture so every one of these circles is a follicle and this is where an ovum is going to develop from a potential ovum will de develop from and um the follicles are found in the in the cortex so if we look at in here oh my gosh look at there all of these these are all follicles you guys holy freak there's a ton of them yeah there's about um 400 of them in if when the girl gets to about puberty um so anyway there there is the cortex and then the medulla is just where all the blood vessels are. i don't i don't really still looks like there's follicles in that medulla so that's it's hard to see but if we go to this next picture the drawing um this is better i'm going to make this bigger Whoop. i'm going to pull it over here and then i'm going to draw okay whoops i guess not i guess i can only draw it at normal size all right so here this is easier to see all right so now i just differentiated between the cortex out here where the follicles are and then the medulla in here where the blood vessels are okay so that's the difference between the cortex and the medulla and the ovary and please remember that um, the follicle development happens within the cortex all the follicles grow within the cortex all right, while we're here, we'll just um, we'll just look at this because it's a good picture. All right, uterine tubes. So here are the uterine tubes. We've got two of them. They're like little Harry Potter arms because they don't have any bones in them. Um, the infundibulum is going to be like the palm of your hand right here that's going to um, hold on to, and so here would be the infundibulum on this side and then um, the fimbrae are like fingers okay so here we have fimbrae and if we look at these fingers that come off of the off the infundibulum the um, ovary and the and the uterine tube are not connected together there's a physical space between them and so when an ovary ovulates its ovum like we're doing in this picture right here we need to have the fingery fimbrae to catch the ovulating ovum and then bring it into the infundibulum and then pass it on down through the uterine tubes and on into the uterus proper okay so um that's those okay then in the uterus we have the body so that's this main part right here would be the body the fundus is up here it's like we have a fundus in the stomach so that big round top of the stomach and then here is the cervix of the female um cervix right there all right now there are three layers to the uterus 
So we'll do those in a different color. Okay, so the very outer part here is the parametrium. Then we have the myometrium. Ooh, that didn't change color like I wanted it to. Myometrium. And then we have the inner portion right here is the endometrium. Boom, 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 boom. All right, so three layers then to the wall of use. Parametrium, myometrium, endometrium. Myometrium is the smooth muscle that where uterine contractions come from to give birth. Oh, dang it, you guys. And then I'll do it next week when we have a baby. Um, I have a little simulation of birth. Um, uh, which is really, really cool. But we'll do it next week because that'll be better because we're going to have a baby next week. So um, make, I thought about this earlier in the week. All right. So make myself a note. All right. Okay. Um, I'm finding notes I can get rid of myself. Okay. Um, Parametrium, myometrium, endometrium, and then functionalis layer, menzies. We'll take a look at that in base house in, when we look at a bigger um, picture of the endometrium. So then the endometrium is what's going to um, uh, be shed. Part of it will be shed when, when we have uh, menstrual flow when we go through menzies. Um, all right, so let's look at that picture then. Uh, okay, this is I'm gonna look at. All right, so we've got some divisions here between the two parts. I'll do this picture. Okay, so here, first of all, right, oops, right there. So from here on up, that is the endometrium. So this is going to be the myometrium. Whereas there we go, smooth muscle. So this is a portion of the myometrium. So all of this down this way, that's myometrium. All right, now if you notice, both in here, okay, and then right here, you can see there's a little bit of difference in the density between the basalis layer, okay, so that's this section right here. Okay, so all of this is basalis. All of this stuff in here, this is all basalis. All right, now the basalis layer is never shed. So it's part of the endometrium, but it's never shed. It's this functionalis layer right here. Oops. Oh, I don't want to do that. No. Okay, so the functionalis layer is this section, oops, right here down to there, and this section down to here. Now the functionalis layer, this is getting ready to have a period. Um, because the spiral arteries and or the spiral vessels, arteries and veins are very, very well developed. The uterine gland is also well developed. We can see all these uterine glands in here. Okay, so this probably um, we got ready to have a baby, and then fertilization and implantation did not occur, and so now we're getting ready to, to have our period. So as we have a period, as a woman has a period she's gonna lose this entire functionalis layer. So all of this will be shed, okay? All of that in there will be lost. And the functionalis layer will remain, the vessels will close off, will seal off so that you don't hemorrhage after when you're having your period, and then um, we'll build it back again. So then the basalis layer will go through, um, go through mitosis, and we'll grow new vessels and new uterine glands and we'll start it all over again. Okay, so um, when, um, when we're having our period, we're losing the functionalis layer, but then the basalis layer will grow back. Now, oh, I got some questions. Um, all right, reabsorbed where? So reabsorbed back into the bloodstream sperm. So I'm going, guessing, Patricia, that was your question. So we just take them back into the bloodstream. All We break them down and, and they just get digested and then we make new sperm out of their material. Um, and so Tony's question, how or why does the endometrium grow outside of the uterus and endometriosis? Yep, 
freaking this endometrium. Whoops. And some women right here, basalis, this material can leave the myometrium and go out. Let's see where it's going to go. So let's go back out here. Okay, so here I've got endometrium inside of here. Now it can leave. Oops, I don't have an arrow. Um, it can leave out through the infundibulum and out through the fimbrae, and then I can grow it in on the wall of the uterus. And let's put a pelvic cavity in here. I can draw grow it in the wall of the pelvic cavity. I can grow it all sorts of places. Um, it's a highly proliferative material, and so it just grows and comes out and, and ends up growing someplace else, and then causes lots of problems for some women because it's not supposed to grow out there. So yeah, women that have endometriosis, I understand, is just so painful. I had a student um, when I was teaching high school in Utah, and she had it and she just oh just was in pain all the time and and uh um her doctor said you know i wish that you were a little older and married and i would say hurry up and get pregnant right now because all of that your body will be so focused on on having a baby that the endometrium and other places usually doesn't grow and you could get a lot of relief and maybe your body would stop growing the endometrium in other places. A lot of times when women have babies, then their endometriosis stops. Um, I know though some women still have issues with it after they've had children and so they have to have hysterectomies and have their uterus removed so that they don't have endometriosis anymore. Um, that growth, let's say that it happens in the uterine tube, can then block the uterine tube so that you know you officially had a tubal ligation and, and the ova can't make it to the to the uterus anymore and the sperm can't make it up to fertilize them. So um, so it's bad. It's it's a bad thing, um, unfortunately. All right. Um, so this is a good picture to be on right now. So I'm going to take a look at the vagina. So that is what's going to grow up and hook into. Um, hook into the uterus because the the um, the vagina is actually ectoderm and the uterus is actually mesoderm and so um, they're gonna come up and meet actually it's endoderm isn't it it's gonna come from the ear genital sinus so it's endoderm and um, so they form independent of each other and so the vagina has to come up and plug in to the uterus. And so as it comes up and plugs into the uterus, then we get these um, pockets on either side right here. So that pocket there, this pocket here, there's a pocket in the front. I mean, the pocket goes all the way around, but when we do a, a coronal section like this, then we get lateral fornix or fornices, so there's a lateral fornix, there's a lateral fornix. If I were to do a sagittal section, oh, let's look at that. Um, I know we had a sagittal section somewhere. Yeah, let's go back to the, there we go. Now I have a anterior posterior fornix, okay? So there's my anterior, there's my posterior fornix. But it just goes all the way around, so it depends on how you cut it. Um, so if we look at this view, let's just go back and review all of our little parts. So here are the fimbrae, this would be the infundibulum, here is the uterine tube, here's the fundus of the uterus, here's the body, here's the cervix, here would be endometrium, here this is myometrium, this is parametrium, uh, this is the vagina. The rugae in the vagina are these ridges. Remember how I told you about um, the glands being uh, the sensitive part of the penis. And so the rugae help in, enhance that sexual response in the male. Um, fornix vaginal orifice, there's the vaginal orifice, the opening right here. Um, vestibular glands are right here. So this um, provides a lubricant for the female during her sexual response. So this should also be lubricated to you know make entry of the of the penis into the vagina uh easier i guess less frictional frictional is that a word 
<laughs> I don't know. Okay, so then let's do the vulva. We'll do the vulva from two different views. So we'll look at this uh, cross section while we're at it. Um, or the sagittal section, I mean. Okay, mons pubis means pubic mountain. Whoops, where's my little drawing thing? Okay, pubic mountain. So here is this fat pad that goes over the top of the pubic bone. Okay, so we've got this fat pad over the top of the pubic bone. Labia majora are these folds out here. Okay, so all of this is labia majora. This is what becomes um, the scrotum in the male, developmentally wise. Um, perineum or perineum, however you say a perineum. Um, I'll show you the perineum in just a minute. Labia minora then are these folds right here that are eventually in the, in the penis. So the penis is, the, the urethra is outside of the penis developmentally in a male. And so then, then the labia minora have to close around it and seal that up. And sometimes that doesn't happen. We'll probably talk about that in, in lec no, I will do it in embryology. Um, when the, when the penis doesn't entirely form around the urethra and you don't get an opening in the end, it, in the, you know, the tip of the penis that the opening is on the backside, hypospadias. Um, and that's how that happens. So when these guys don't, form together around the, um, around the penis. But we'll talk about that when we talk about development. So cool. Embryology. Oh my gosh, you guys, you don't even know. Um, clitoris is the erectile tissue in a female. So this is what developed into the erectile tissue in a male, but it just is that little original collection of erectile tissue embryonically. And then the vestibule is the, and I'll show you the vestibule because it's hard to see from this angle. Okay, um, so let's go to the perineum. All right, so here's the perineum, everything surrounded by the dotted line. So from the, from the mons pubis back towards the anus, this is the perineal region. Um, so now when you do perineal care and CNA, yeah, you're learning how do you take care of your patient and make sure that you clean this area out when, if they're incontinent or whatever, or a baby, okay, when you're changing the baby. Um, so the vestibule is all of this region surrounded by the labia majora, whoops, okay, and the labia minora too, for that matter, okay. So all the area inside of here, like it has this bracket right here. All of that is the vestibule. And you know, dang it, I hate the vestibule in baby girls. When you're trying to change their diapers and they have poopy pants, you just, oh my gosh, you know, boys in poopy diapers are so easy to clean because you just kind of rub around everything and you wipe it all down and, and you're good to go. Girls though, you got to look in all the folds and the little crevices and everything to make sure that there isn't anything hiding in there. So, ugh. I hate changing poopy baby girl diapers. Okay, um, so let's go over the parts from this view. So here's the mons pubis right here, labia majora right there, labia minora right here. So we got vestibule then, here's the clitoris, there's the urethral orifice, here's the vaginal orifice. Here are the um, greater, vestibular, the openings, the ducts of the greater vestibular glands or Bartholin's glands. And that's everything on that. And then last but not least, oh see, this is so fast and we're done. Let's go to, um, to the breast, okay, to the mammary glands. All right, now all of this brown colored tissue in here is all um, uh, milk producing tissue, lactiferous tissue. Okay, so these lobules in here all are going to produce milk, okay? And you need to have ducts from these lobules. So this is a duct, this is a duct, 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 duct. Look at all these ducts in here. Each lobule has its own duct. So there's not just, and there's just three in that picture, but there's a whole bunch, oh, just all back in there. Um, Cause each one of those is gonna produce just a tiny little drop of milk but each of them, but then you put it all together and then it's gonna come out more in a stream like you would have in a typical baby bottle. 
but that's not how it works in a, in a mom, in a breast. So each one of those lobules has its own lactiferous duct that will all collect in the nipple so that then when the baby nurses, then it comes out as a, as, you know, a bigger total amount of milk. But it's not just one opening in that you just, you know, have a, like a sack of milk. It's not like that at all. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so so that's the lactiferous ducts are going to end in the nipple, and then around the outside of the nipple is the areola, is this darker area. Area, um, okay, so lactiferous ducts. All right, now um, why have this dark area? Um, the idea, because babies are super nearsighted, they can't see very far. That they need something to focus on to help them target to when they're, when, you know, nuzzling is one thing. They're, they're searching for a breast. I was, I saw somebody had a, had a thing on, on Twitter, or Instagram or something like this, that somebody showed, I can't even remember who showed it to me, um, that this man was home with his baby and uh, the mom was, I don't know, she was at work or wherever she was and he was fixing a bottle and the baby was just so hungry. And this was a pretty newborn baby. And so he's trying to get the bottle ready and the little girl um, hooks on to his chest and just starts sucking on it. And then he finally detaches her for the bottle and she given him this big old hickey. And uh, <laughs> I thought, that. and so then he like, like super appreciated everything that his wife did after that, as far as taking care of their baby. Um, Cause he said it was so painful and left this big old hickey, but serves him right. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so the idea is that it gives them a target more than just nuzzling and you want to make sure ladies, if you haven't breastfed before, um, when you breastfeed, if you can try to breastfeed at least for a little while, I'm not the best breast nurser in the world. Cause I always worked with my kids, so they didn't nurse for very long, but at least I gave them what they could. And you want to make sure that they take all the areola into their mouth not just the nipple don't let them nurse just on the nipple force that whole thing in their mouth and latch on to all the way around that because if they just latch on to your nipple oh my gosh in about 10 minutes you're gonna die and it's gonna hurt for days and you can bleed and all sorts of things yep i'm speaking from experience um my youngest was not the best nurser in herself and and um so, uh, so that's what you need to do. <laughs> just, just so you know. All right. So is that, she, is that why your areola and nipple typically get darker when you oh, are no, pregnant? Yes. It's, so it's, it's you can, um, see it better. Yeah. After, so some of the hormones, I think it's oxytocin that makes it darker. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's a, it's a better target. But it's one of those hormones. Maybe it's progesterone. I don't know. I would suggest it's either progest oxytocin, maybe, because you don't get lots of oxytocin until you're, you know, getting ready to have a baby. So I would imagine that would be the hormone that would cause that hyperpigmentation. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Well, if there are no other comments, then then that's it on reproduction. So Next Tuesday, the 21st, then your quiz on these. So I'll give you about five and five. So five male structures, five female structures. Um, but that's all I have for you. So it's really easy lab. <laughs> so I was like, yay, we're getting down to the end where it's not so hard. All right, so the rest of the time then you can leave if you want. Freaking Logan's not even here. Well, okay. Does anybody I'm go over like the ABGs in our packet or are you going to create new ones? I'm going to create new ones. I am not okay. going over ones that I already have because that's, okay. that's all for you guys. Perfect. So I'm just going to do it for a few minutes because I thought Logan would be here and I don't see that he is. So he's going to have to get help independently or something. I don't know. All right. So let's go to my whiteboard. And get rid of this. Okay, so well, let me go into text. All right, so let me um, think of some. 
really quick. <laughs> I had to come up with some new, some numbers here. So bear with me. Um, let's see. Um, I gotta think of what I want first. Okay, we'll do that one. Um, um, okay, so I'm still texting. All right, so pH of 7.24. A PCO2 of um, 53 and a bicarb of 29. Didn't put, oh my gosh, I'm so units. You have to put units in here. All right, we'll just use this and then I'll just um, erase the numbers. Okay, boom. All right, so who wants to walk me through this? Okay, so the pH is lower, so it's gonna be acidosis. Okay, so there I put my low arrow in, okay? And so then right here is acidosis. Okay. Um, the 53 is higher, so it's going to be respiratory acidosis. Yes. Okay. And 29 is higher. Okay. So it's going up as well. Okay. All right, so now if we know it's respiratory acidosis, because it's right, if we look at, oh, look, Alyssa, the arrows are in the opposite direction. So yes, this is the seesaw effect. So this is respiratory acidosis. So now if we know that it's respiratory acidosis, then we know automatically that it's gonna be what? Renal. Good. Renal. A renal comp oops compensation okay so now here comes the tricky part which kind partial it's partial yes it is partial whoops and why is it part whoa don't capitalize it because your hco3 is out of range yes because it is out of range too so my my um this my cause and my, um, my compensating value is out of range. So I know, so everything's out of range right here. So if everything's out of range, it's always going to be partial, regardless of the cause. Okay, all right. Um, oh, let's see. And then our bonus would be just COPD, right? Yeah, COPD, right. Okay. So let's go ahead and put that in here. Okay, so I got a con, hang on, I got a, got a chat thing. All right, yes, thank you, Ella. Okay, so let's do another one. Let me make up some numbers here. Um, oh, wait a minute. And, um, and okay, all right, that should work. Okay, so pH is oops. CO2 and is all right. So the pH is currently in range. Yes. Okay. 
All right. No, I don't do that. Hang on. That's not how I do it. So we're going to need to figure out the next two steps in order to figure out if it's high or low, right? Okay. Yes. So hang on. Let me, I don't know how to do that. Let me draw instead. All right. Okay. So it's slightly high, but it's within range, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I like to put my dotted arrows in like that. All right. So we know though, because it's slightly high that it's what? Alkalosis. Right. Okay. So now we got to worry about the rest of the stuff. Okay. So PCO2 is? Hi. And bicarbs are? Hi. Hi. All right. So now these two arrows are going in the same direction. So can it be a respiratory cause? No. Nope. So what is it? If it's not respiratory, it's metabolic. Okay. So metabolic alkalosis. Perfect. Okay. My pH is within range. Oops. So it is. Oh, let's put it right here. Oh, the pH is in range. That means it's full. Right. Full respiratory yeah. compensation. And so full what? Full respiratory. Yep. Perfect. And then what's my what's my thing? Hyperventilation. Nope. Because no? it's metabolic. Oh, metabolic. Dang it. So it would be vomiting. Vomiting. Oh. Or constipation. Yeah. Or too many tums. Right? Okay. Let me look at my chat thing. I should just keep my chat board. Yes. Okay. Very good. Move that over there. Okay. All right. Let's do another one. Um, okay. Um, Can you do one that has like um, the PCO2 or something like that, that is within range. I keep getting confused on that one. Okay. Um, and then, um, okay. So let's do this one. My pH is 7.26. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I am so dead there. <laughs> um, what did I have? Um, okay, while I'm typing this out, I gotta tell you this. I got an email from a former student. She's in first block right now. And um, she said, we're doing ABGs in, in first block. And she said, the way they were teaching it down in the nursing department, she says, I was so confused. She says, I just could not figure out how they were getting it with the way that they were doing it. She says, so I went back, I dug out my ABG stuff from when I was in your class. And she says, I had it in a minute. So, um, so not that I'm spectacular or anything in what I do, but I know how to get you to understand this in a relatively uncomplicated way. And, um, and so if you stay with what I teach you, then you will get it when you go there. So keep all of this ABG stuff. Um, Logan was telling me his, his, all his family's in medicine. He's got lots of nurses in his family. I taught his brother that's a, and his sister-in-law that are, went through the nursing program. And, and um, um, he said, so, you know, what's the, what's the one thing that I really need to know that you're going to use all the time? And they go, oh my gosh, ABGs. Make sure you know how to do ABGs. Um, if you do, when you get down to the nursing program, they do the Rome method. If you've looked on, you know, you've Googled it and stuff. Rome confuses me. So that's why I don't even, I don't even teach you that, that how, what they usually use. This is my own thing that I've kind of put together over the years to make it hopefully as 
as understandable as possible for as long as you are going to need to know how to do this. So, um, so just keep plugging away till you, till you get it. And then, and, oh, one other thing that's really funny. Um, uh, oops. I usually, um, when my students, when we do this and then, and then they have their exam on it and then, um, my students are always, Ms. G, please put an ABG on the final. Please give us as many ABGs as you can because this is something we can grab on to hold and know and do and be successful and get extra credit on it and everything. So, so that's what I'm trying to do with you guys is just get you to the point where I've had my other students get to. So, okay. So anyway, now I've got my thing out. So now what? So what is 7.26? Lower, so it's, it's low. acidosis. Okay, so put that over here. Oops. I'll put that over here on top of this arrow. All right, good. All right, so it's some kind of acidosis. Now what about this 41? It's within range. Yeah, so we're going to put no change. Okay, and then what about this one? Um, it's like lower. Her is low, good. Okay, so now what do I do with this? So it will be metabolic acidosis? Yeah, it'll be metabolic. Oops. Metabolic acidosis, okay. So we know if it's metabolic acidosis, it's automatically gonna be respiratory, whoops, compensation, okay, but what about this? Okay, so if it's respiratory compensation, this value should be doing something to fix the problem, right? Oh, well, so then it's no. It's no, because it's not doing anything to fix the problem, so it's no respiratory compensation. Okay. Yeah, so so it's no when the respiratory or when the when the compensating value is within normal range. Okay. Okay. So what would be my bonus on this one? Uh, severe diarrhea. Okay. Or starvation. Starvation, oops. Um, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, um, renal failure. Renal. Okay, so any time the PCO2 is within range, it's always or, gonna be Or no. let me do one more. Let's do this one over here. Okay. Um, make you really sick. And then, um, is, um, All right, so what do we do with this one? So that's really high. pH is high. Okay. Um, PCO2 is low. Okay. And that's within range. Okay. All right, so. So if it's high, it's gonna be alkalosis. Um, this is, so it's going to be respiratory alkalosis. Yeah. Just look at my arrows. Are they going in the same direction? Nope. No. Nope. So this is respiratory. Okay. Oh, dang it. So then it's going to be renal compensation. Okay. And that would be no, right? right? And why, Becca? Because the HCO3 is within range. Perfect. Because that's the compensating value. Right. Value, so therefore it's going to be no. Okay. Right. Yep. And then, and like Ella says, hyperventilation is your bonus. Let's put that in there because people walking, walking, people watching later won't see the chat. Ventilation. Okay. 
All right. Okay, so every time the pH is within range, we that's where we need to decide whether it's going to be, it was probably higher or it was probably lower when we got this snapshot that it, or snapshot that it was in range, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yep. Okay. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay, anybody need anything else? There's one of each. Hey, Ms. G. Yeah. The yes. second to last one that you did, yeah. if the, yeah. um, the last probably... value would have been um, above 26 yes. equivalents, then would it have changed it to respiratory acidosis or oh. no? Nope. Okay. No? So if this number were high and this number were the same, then this number would have to be high and it would change it to metabolic alkalosis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Because if my PCO2 isn't going to be changing at all, then this value, the bicarb value, is going to make it either acidosis or alkalosis. Okay. Because it's low right here, it makes it acidosis. But if I were to change this and make it like 29 or 30, then this would be like 7.5, 7.51, something like that. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Ms. G. Yes. So when you do the dotted line for the pH, do you yes. not do a dotted line for the PCO2 or the bicarb? No, nope, because those are out of range. Okay, so if I were to do a dotted line for the second to last one you did on the PCO2, yeah. it would totally mess with it and make yeah, it don't, respiratory? Don't do that. Yeah. Don't, because this one, don't, the only time you do dotted lines is in the pH. Okay. Because the dotted line is indicating that it's full compensation. Because if we look at this one right here, I'm in normal range. But because my values are out, that means I'm sick. And just at this moment that my, my breathing was low enough, that I was hypoventilating enough, that it, it, raised, or it lowered my pH, to bring it back into normal range. This used to be more than 7.45. But because I held my breath so much that the acid build up, that it lowered my pH back into normal range. But it's still, it was really high from before because I had all this bicarb. So could we assume, or would this be the same every time um, with the PCO2 and the HCO3? Um, how their arrows are both going up, would that automatically mean the pH would be up if we're confused on whether to go high or low? Um, no. Okay. No, because if you look at here, see my arrows are up, my arrows are up, here I'm in acidosis, here I'm in alkalosis. You always okay. have to go with what your pH is. So the pH, it's just dependent um, which one it's closer to. No, which one would which one possibly would cause that to happen? So let's go back and let's think about these right here. So I have a low pH, right? Right. Okay. So how do I get a low pH? I either have too many hydrogen ions or not enough bicarbs, right? No. Okay. So if we look at this first question, look at this. I have lots of CO2. Well, what do we know if I have lots of CO2? Let's put this down here because this will help. Okay, so if I have lots of CO2, then oh, dang, that's not in line. Oh, well. <laughs> Then I get lots, oops, oops. Okay, so remember, if I have lots of CO2 right here, I will end up having lots of hydrogen ions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so am I acidic? Yeah. In this case, right here? Yes. yes. So where did those hydrogen ions come from? That lots of CO2, right? 
Okay. Okay. So now that's okay. So that works, but let's look at the bicarb now. So we said, what gives you acidosis? Too many hydrogen ions, too few bicarbonate, right? Yeah. Okay. So now look at this bicarbonate level. Do I have too few bicarbs or too many bicarbs? Too many. Too many bicarbs. So did my bicarb level make me acidic? Yes. No. No, right? So why do I have too many bicarbs? It's to counteract. So I made more of these right here to take these puppies out of solution. Okay. Okay. Does that help? Yes. I'll okay. So the arrows make it easy just because if I can memorize what the arrows do, then I can do the problem. But really, my goal is to help you with the underlying cause. I mean, here's, here's the physiology that's going on, right? Right. Okay, so if we look at this one, at the next one, so let's just go through the physiology of all of them. Yeah, so I'm, I've just been having a hard time with like if the pH is in range, mm. when to go say it's been high or when to say it's been low. Okay, because it's gonna be on one side of 7.4 or the other. Okay. I will never give you a question that's 7.4. Okay, so if it's lower than 7.4, we're saying it's going down. If it's higher right. than 7.4, we're saying it's going up. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, does anybody else have anything before we go? Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Miss G. You're so very welcome. And then also anybody, anybody watching this later on, let me know if you have any problems, but hopefully this, this uh, helped you through things. So I'm going to save this and um, go away and then stop sharing. Okay. So then I can come back to it if I need to. I don't know why I would though. All right. Well, you guys have a great rest of your day and then I will see you tomorrow at nine o'clock. And what are we doing tomorrow? We're finishing off fluids and maybe start into acid base stuff. That's still lots of stuff about acid base that I want to, I mean, the physiology of acids and bases I want to talk to you about. So, okay. So we'll do that tomorrow. Have a great day. Love you guys. Bye.